So I'm Jenna. I have been working at HRA since we were the Washington Humane Society. Um, and then the two shelters in DC merged, and now we're one big shelter. Um, I started, I came into animal welfare because I really liked animals and I loved the idea of fostering. I started out as a volunteer with a rescue organization and that's how I found out about animal welfare and sheltering. I moved on to, to working at the front desk um, and then the foster position opened up and I was like, I, I want that. And when I stepped into that program, there was no structure, no prioritizing of animals. We were just like, acting like Oprah, just giving out animals to anybody that wanted them and like not following up with them because we were desperate. We were a, a municipal inner city shelter, open admissions. We had no valve for our, our influx. Um, in the, the, my first summer there, I, I had no idea what a neonatal kitten was. I'd never seen one before in my life. I didn't know that they needed like special care. I, like nothing. I didn't know anything. Just that like we needed to make space and we needed to figure out how to get kittens into foster. Um, and so that's where I started. Um, and so with the help of Marnie Russ, who's with the Neonatal Kitten Foundation, she really helped me learn about the care of neonatal kittens and helped us do trainings and helped us build up our program. And it took us years. So this isn't something that you should expect that like you're gonna be able to do tomorrow or even by the end of this kitten season. And so I, what I hope you can get from this presentation is pieces of inspiration to help motivate you to figure out what's going to work really well for yourself, your organization, um, and, and start from there. And the other thing I want to offer is that Alice and I really feel very passionately about helping people grow and build programs and help save more animals. So this is, we're going to talk like kind of at a high level about things and I'm going to move through a lot of topics because I want to be able to expose everybody to a lot of information. We will be sharing, I'll show you a couple resources that we've developed. We'll be sharing all of that with you guys um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you can figure out how it's going to work best for what you all need to do, okay? All right, so I thought I'd get us started with this like adorable video that our media team made. So super adorable, right? Like that's how you bring people in is like you could have cute animals like this in your house for like just a month and then you could pass them off. And um, so I love tools like this to use on social media. Okay, so before I start talking about all this stuff, who is like stoked and ready for kitten season? Great. Who is kind of like, kind of like, I mean, they're cute and all, but uh, 
who's like, please don't give me any bottle babies. <laughs> I know. They're a lot of work, guys. I know. We know they're a lot of work. We're going to talk about that. Um, but let's talk about why neonatal kitten programs are so important. So this is a graph of um, basically our daily count across locations, or our monthly count across locations. And so these little guys are, we have two shelter locations in DC, so that represents the, the cats that are in the shelter. And then the blue line represents the kitty cats that are in foster. So this is all felines, not just kittens. But as you can see, bam, 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 you got major kitten season going on. <laughs> What I love about this graph is it shows how you completely expand your capacity to take care of cats. Because if you are operating out of a brick and mortar building, you only have a certain number of spaces where you can house and care for animals. And obviously, a shelter, is it's really difficult to provide great care to fragile populations like neonatal kittens. So basically, one, I love for people to see like what kitten season looks like. I also use this now because I have fosters that get really mad at me when I don't have kittens for them. And I'm like, I literally don't have kittens for you right now because it's like March, April, but they, I promise they are coming. So, um, and I hope that in a couple years, you will get to that point too where you have foster parents who are like really angry and they're like, well, I'm just gonna go to another organization if you can't give me kittens. And I'm like, I don't have them to give you. Like, what do you want me to do? Um, so, so that's the why. The why is you significantly expand your life-saving capacity. Um, let's see. OK. So let's look at the another. And then this will be the end of the charts, OK? Um, so the other thing I want to point out is kitten season can feel really overwhelming. And so what I did is I looked at the number of animals that we placed by foster reason. So too young are those guys that are like around six, four to six weeks. They can eat on their own, um, but not big enough to get spayed or neutered. Unweaned nursing is they come with a mama. Unweaned orphan is you've got to feed them all by yourself. And then we have our grumpy kittens over there at the end. And so um, if you see the orphan population for this, this is a, a close to 2,000 kittens over the last couple years. The orphan population of that is only 363. So that's about 120-ish a year that we're placing with an intake of about 10 to 12,000 animals a year. So I show you this because I want you to understand that it's still a very small population. Even though they require a lot of resource and skill, it is doable. You can do this. Um, and we're going to talk all about that. <laughs> um, so let's see. The biggest piece that we have found is that involving your community and telling them that there's a need is the way that you solve this problem. Um, and we'll talk about how to be transparent and how to advertise and all of that stuff. But the key was to get people excited about this and get them in and taking care of these guys. Was it perfect? Did people know what they were doing? No, because I didn't really know what I was doing either. So, But every year, we figured out a new and better way to improve how we were doing this and to build our skill set and to build our foster parent skill set. And then we got foster parents coming back who really knew what they were doing. And we could do tube feeding classes. And we could do fluids classes. And they could mentor other foster parents when they were new and had to do these advanced techniques. Um, so again, it's all about building and like looking at your numbers and seeing it's not as overwhelming as it might feel right now. Um, and then the other big point that I want to talk about is, well, at first it was just me saying, all right, we're going to try and send these guys out. Eventually, our entire organization got behind saving this population. And so... What we do at HRA is, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, is all staff participate in feeding the babies. We train all of our staff. There's a schedule that we adhere to so that when they are in our care, they are actually receiving the care that they need. Um, and then we have a goal of placement within 24 hours um, of them arriving at the shelter and to foster. And we'll talk about how we do all of that stuff too. Um, but I think that that is a big key is that 
oftentimes neonatal populations become the sole responsibility of the foster program, the placement coordinator, whatever position that is. And everybody else is like, hands off, I'm not touching those little things. Um, but to the leadership in this room, the best thing you can do is make these guys our animals. These are our animals just like any cat or dog or any other critter that would come in. We're going to provide them the care that we need. We, we're going to talk about resources and limitations and all that stuff too. But having that philosophy of these are, these are our animals too. All right. All right. So you can do this. I want everybody to hear me. You, you can do this. This is possible. Even, if they, even though they require round-the-clock care, even though they require specialized information, you can do this. Um, every successful program starts somewhere, right? And it starts with someone saying, I think I, think I can do this. And I don't think you all would be here if you, weren't, if you didn't think that. Um, so I, I hope everyone leaves today feeling confident that they have the skills to figure out a program, programmatic structure and that they understand how to take care of these guys. Um, and then back to that organizational buy-in. We need that organizational buy-in that, yes, we can do this so that everybody's on board, because it really does take everybody pitching in to support this population of animals. Um, and the best thing is, is when you say yes, you are extending your ability to provide life-saving resources to the animals in your community, which is huge. And I think most people want to get behind that. It's a cause that people can get behind, um, and, and they'll want to save their lives. All right. So building the program, you do need to be realistic. You can't just say, we're going to save every single kitten this year that comes through our door. I think that's an admirable goal. Um, but I want everybody to be realistic, too. Um, so what you want to determine are what are your protocols for taking care of this population? Um, what are the expectations within your organization regarding the level of care that staff should be providing? Um, and how do they provide that care? Um, what staff are you able to commit to caring for this population? Um, what are your protocols going to be for intake? Um, will we designate a specific team or distribute the care among all, the, all of the staff in the, in the shelter within our organization? What are your budgets? Do you have a budget for care supplies? I mean, you need to provide formula. You need to have bottles, nipples. I love miracle nipples. I think they make feeding so much easier. Um, ways to keep the kittens warm, snuggle safes, heating pads, incubators. Um, what is that budget? Do you have the budget this year? Can you create an Amazon wish list? Can you ask a donor to provide those supplies? Um, so you have that stuff sta um, ready to go in the shelter, in your organization. Um, and then um, what about the medical care for this population? Because it is a fragile population, we need to decide what level of care we're going to be able to provide as an organization. I mean, if you start out as, if they're showing X, Y, and Z symptoms, then that's going to be a euthanasia decision for us this year. That's OK. That's a place to start. Um, but if you have additional resources, not everybody has a doctor on site. Not everybody has trained techs or staff on site to start out with with this population. So. I just want you all to have a plan in place so that you can have some good practices to figure out which ones are we going to prioritize for placement and foster and which ones are we going to have to say goodbye to um, because that will really help you manage your resources really well. And then every year, figure out how to expand what you're able to do, right? As, you, as the program grows, as people get, get on board, your resources and your capacity for care will expand. Um, where are they going to stay when they get there? That's a big question. I mean, especially brick and mortar shelters, they are designed to house adult cats and dogs primarily. I mean, like we even have struggled to figure out where we're going to put the non-cat and dog 
bunnies and guinea pigs and fish and iguana and stuff. Um, so where is that going to be? We have basically a hallway <laughs> that we st stuck um, shorelines. The top three are for neonatal kittens. That's what we did. It's not pretty. It's kind of grody, but that's where they stay. That's where all the staff know that they are. That's where we have all of our supplies set up. Um, we have a, a little like wall heater set up there to keep the room nice and warm. Um, and for our little itty bitty worms, we have an incubator up front that we use for those guys. Um, but all of that stuff has to kind of be thought out and everybody, you gotta get people <laughs> to agree to use that space. Like it took a while for us to like, talk to medical and animal care and behavior that that was gonna be the space because we were taking up three of their cages for medical for their treatment spaces, right? Like there's always a negotiation when you're working with a fixed space. Um, I mean, ideally it would be isolated, which is why we chose that hallway because it wasn't in with a bunch of other cats and like a bunch of other people moving through. But if you can't do that, that's okay. Just do the best you can with the resources that you have. Um, and then, I mean, ideally there would be like a sink and a refrigerator and a microwave in there, but like, <laughs> that's funny. We don't even have that. Like we have to go to three different rooms to like mix up the formula and like get the laundry and all of that stuff. Like as many supplies as we could put in there, we did, but we have to mix formula in one place. We have to go get the washcloths in another place. We have to hit the, hit the snuggle, safe up, snuggle safe up in the break room. Like, it's not the most convenient, but we've figured out a way to make it work. Um, and then how long will you be able to care for this population while they are in the shelter? It is realistic to set timelines. If you are a very small shelter and you don't have the staffing, then maybe you say they have until the end of the day to find a place to go. That's an okay place to start. Give yourself permission to do that. Um, at HRA, we have a contract with the district that we have to be a 24-7 organization, so we're really lucky that we're staffed 24-7. So figure out what that's gonna be for your organization. Maybe you have a sliding scale of based on their age and their ability to eat and the, the timelines for how frequently they need to be fed. Um, but, but think about that and figure that out because what you don't want is you don't wanna be arbitrary. You wanna be more strategic about how you're using your resources. I also wanted to say there'll be about 15 minutes at the end of this if you have questions, so please write them down. I really want to talk through stuff if people have questions, okay? All right. All right, building the program, an in-shelter care plan. This is where I have my links, okay. So um, when they arrive, you want staff to be able to immediately evaluate and determine the care plan. And so they need to know the age, the temperature, and any, be able to recognize any signs of illness in this population. And so for our staff to be able to do that, we've created a couple of resources. Oop. Why doesn't this like wanna grab y'all? Okay. So we have a SOG, standard operating, it's a guideline, um, about aging kittens. And so our staff, this is online, our staff can reference it at any time. And it talks about how they grow, what they look like. Um, and then I love that it has a really great description of their teeth because that's a great way to age um, kittens. So this will be something that we will be happy to share with your organization. Um, so we individually identify every single kitten. We put nail polish on their ears. Some people use Sharpies, but we use different colors because it's really important to know which kitten is gaining weight, which kitten is eating, how much that kitten is eating, which one's having snot come out of its eyes, which one's having weird poop. Like all of those things are really important. And when you have a litter of all black kittens, like you definitely need a little help telling them apart. But because we have different staff handling the animals, we wanna have some consistency with how people are able to identify them. Um, 
The other thing that we do is when neonatal kittens or puppies arrive, we have an email group that all of the folks who are responsible for feeding these guys are on. And so our front desk who does our intake sends that email out and says, we've got a group of three kittens around three days old. They were cold when they came in. They're currently being heated up in the incubator. We'll try to feed. Or if they know how well they're feeding, they'll talk about that stuff and they talk about if they're in the incubator and they're in one of our shoreline cages. Um, and so that lets everybody know they need to, during their shift, go feed these guys. Um, let's see. So care during their stay. So I wanna show you that we have a feeding guide for these guys. So it goes from how you weigh them, how you protect them from, do your, how you can do your best to protect them from infectious disease, how to keep them warm, that it's important to keep them warm, um, and then like how to feed them, like the appropriate positioning, and we go through like amounts and timelines and all of that good stuff. So again, something else that we will be sharing with you guys. Um, okay. And then we use a chart, basically, that we just put on their cage that everybody fills out that says, so-and-so fed this kitten, it went to the bathroom, what kind of bathroom it went, what it weighed, all of that good stuff so that the next team coming on knows what to expect. It's easy for us to monitor and see how things are going with the kittens. Um, so that's, that's how we monitor them. Uh, let's see. Make it big again. Um, so what I want to talk about next is like how we get creative with after hour cares. Because like who here is an actual 24-7 facility? Is there anybody? Oh cool. All right. So two. Cool. Um, all right. So what I want to avoid because this is a not, it's not a sustainable model to have staff like stay overnight and take care of them or to always have the same three staff members take the babies home at night. It's great if you have staff that can be in that rotation, but you wanna build out the way that you're able to care for these guys because what you don't want is you don't wanna burn out your foster people or your placement coordinators. You want those folks to stay <laughs> because they will help you build your program. Um, so, I think you need to figure out what's gonna work for your organization, but I have some suggestions. And one of which is to have on-call bottle feeders that will take them that night, and then you place them the next day in a more permanent foster home. So they know, I'm rolling up to the shelter, I'm grabbing those bottle babies tonight, and then they're gonna hook me up with the permanent foster by the end of the, the day, or morning, or whatever. Um, I think if you have a rotation of those people, you expand your ability and your capacity to take care of them, and you're not putting the burden just on your staff. Um, and you can have a phone tree, you can have an email list, you can have a, it's up to you what's gonna work for the, the folks that are helping you out, but um, I, I just think it is so important not to burn yourselves out on this population, and you can do that very easily by always taking on the overnight care of them. And like I said before, you may have criteria that says they've gotta be out of the building and if we don't have placement, then we need to send them to heaven because we can't provide humane care for them, okay? Um, let's see. The other thing that we have tried, and it just wasn't very sustainable for our organization, but it might be really a great way to manage this, is have an overnight nursery that's staffed by volunteers. Um, especially if you're a private shelter, you probably have a little bit more leeway with who can come in and come out of your building. Um, and they come in and they sign up for shifts, and they come in, they take care of the babies, and they go, and then the next shift comes in and they take care of the babies. So they only have to do one shift if they want. Um, surprisingly, I had lots of overnight folks that wanted to come in. Um, you know, an hour or two out of the night is 
not a big deal for a lot of people. Um, and they may not be able to take bottle babies full time, but this is a great way for them to contribute. So something to consider um, is allowing folks to come into your building and maybe you have just a special room that they're allowed to go into and take care of the babies while staff are at home getting the rest that they need. Um, and I just wanna say like, be, be creative. Don't limit yourself to what you've done before and don't let the, we've never done this before, we haven't done it that way before ever stand in your way of trying something new. Building the process. So inevitably with these guys, there are emergencies. Um, so the first thing is to define what an emergency is for this population, for your organization. Um, and whatever that is, that's your determination based on your resources. Um, so whatever your level to provide humane care for them is, wherever you're starting, that's okay. Um, for us, vomiting and or diarrhea or more than 24 hours of anorexia weight loss or active bleeding that won't stop constitutes an emergency or urgent um, need for care. Um, and then with us, we have a couple options and we have a medical on-call system that we use in the evening to figure out next steps for those animals. Um, sometimes it's that they are seen in the morning, sometimes it's, I'm sorry, but we can no longer provide humane care, that kitten is suffering, we need to euthanize the kitten. Um, sometimes it's, I know that seems scary, but that's normal. <laughs> um, and if you're really concerned, just make a, make a kitten puppy appointment and we'll see you. But there's a lot of panic in fostering, we all know that. So, um, so those, are, those are our options. Um, and so the figuring out what happens after business hours for you guys. Are you gonna have a medical on call system? Are you gonna have a special neonatal on call system? Are you not gonna have that? And, Foster, you just let your fosters know after hours, we will not be able to provide supportive resources. We'll be available again at eight, nine, 10, whatever it is your availability is. And so, um, and just be honest with people so they know what to expect. Um, let's see. So what happens? The other option is, do you have like standing orders with a veterinary and emergency vet in your area? Can you give your fosters um, a way to access those services? Is that something you want your fosters to have access to? Um, and how is that gonna work? Are you gonna say, if these symptoms come in, do X, Y, and Z, but don't exceed this amount of money? Um, if these symptoms come in, that's our threshold for euthanasia. Um, if these symptoms come in, send them home, that's not an emergency. Um, so those are a couple strategies for figuring out how you provide that emergency urgent care overnight. Okay, now we need to get fosters, right? Um, emotions inspire action. So it is not wrong to show a gorgeous picture like this of this kitten pleading, look at him with his little paws, for someone to take him home and take care of him, right? Um, I mean, kittens almost sell themselves, really, but I think what's important is you tell your story and you tell where you're at with your ability to take care of these guys and that you wanna take on the care of these kittens. It's not something, it's something you've been trying to do. It's something that you've been doing, but you wanna do better. It's something that you've never tried before, but you really want to save this population of animals. Wherever you are, I say let people know that. I think it's okay for people to know where you are and what your needs are. Um, so talk about the good stuff with kittens. They are adorable. It is a limited time commitment if that's how you wanna structure your program. We give our fosters the option to just like have a revolving door of bottle babies they want. So once they can eat on their own, they go to another foster home and the foster takes care of the rest of what needs to be taken care of until they're adopted. Um, we also give them the option, some people get really invested in their litters and they wanna keep them through adoption, that's cool too. Um, but at most it's an eight week commitment if you get the youngest of babies. 
Um, but if you don't, it could be a two week commitment and then you pass them off, right? So it's a very limited commitment to save this adorable face who really needs your help. Um, um, talk about that it's fun. Like if you've ever had kittens in your house like, and you have the TV on, are you watching the TV or are you watching the kittens? You're watching the kittens. Like they're just so entertaining and adorable. Um, talk about the tough stuff. I see this and I, it, I know it can sound a little rough, but look, if we don't try, they are going to die. That is the reality of the situation. I think that's okay to say to people, this isn't a population we can sustain in the shelter for a long time, but in your home, they can thrive. You can give them a life. You can, you can raise a kitten so someone has a new companion in their family. So I can't say that enough. If we don't try, they are gonna die. That is the reality of the situation. Um, so that kind of leads into my next point, why we need the public's help, why we need their help. Um, talk about people, people don't know there's a kitten season, y'all. They don't know that this is an adorable thing that happens. It's scary and overwhelming to us shelter folks, but when people hear kitten season, they're like, what? <laughs> so we, I think we sometimes forget because we know all the animal stuff, right? And we, we're like, oh, kitten season. Um, but tell them, tell them we get this huge influx. Our capacity of kitty cats expands by three times or whatever it is for your organization. And almost all of that expansion is baby cats, right? So talk about why you cannot physically house those cats. They are not big enough to be spayed or neutered, so you can't put, get them into homes quickly. And all they do if they stay in your shelter or with your organization is they're taking up valuable, valuable, valuable real estate and cage space that you need to be able to move those adult and adoptable animals through so that you can maximize your capacity to care for all of the animals coming through your front doors. Um, um, because of the round-the-clock round care, because of the special attention that they need, with all of the other animals and all of the other things that staff, all the people that staff are, are required to take care of, it is very difficult in a shelter setting to provide sustained care for these guys. I mean, unless you have like a kitten nursery with staffing, which I don't know if anybody's, nobody's there yet, right? You probably wouldn't be here if you were. Um, like, unless you have that established within your organization, it's difficult to sustain the care of these guys in, in, an, in an organization that's dedicated to, that's also in the middle of the big influx of all of the animals that they have to take care of. Um, so talk, talk about that. Like, we need a place for these guys to go, and your home's a great place for that. Um, and I would say at some point, I, I tend to stay away from this because I like to be positive. I like to have an advertising vibe to when you're trying to get people to come in the door. But if you're starting at a place where you have to euthanize every neonatal kitten that's coming through your doors right now, I would tell people that. This is not a population that we can care for. And here's what our alternative is right now. So if you've got a few weeks and want to learn how to give bottles to adorable kittens like this. We want you to come help us, right? All right, myth busting. Every time I talk about fosters, people always say, but I couldn't, I can't imagine doing that. Whatever population I'm fostering, they always say that. And I'm like, okay, let me talk about this for a second. Um, the first one always is I can never deal with having to give them up. Well, can you deal with the fact that they're dying in shelters right now? That's the alternative, that's the truth, right? So could you take care of them for four weeks and know that you saved two to six kittens? That's, that's a cool thing to like think about and know that you did and know that like they went to families and are now really making a lot of people happy. Um, my kids won't understand if they die. No, but you can help them understand. Death is part of life. That is something that we deal with. This is my personal opinion. I think feeling grief and learning how to deal with grief early on is a really great skill set for human beings to have. Um, you know, think about how hard it is like when you're 15, 30, and you're encountering your first like loss. That's difficult to process, but 
Children are so resilient. I have lots of families with kids that foster this population or foster kittens, and the kids are great. They probably do better than their parents when it's time to say goodbye to them because it's just part of how that works for them, right? Um, I couldn't handle euthanasia. It's hard, euthanasia is hard, and I don't think that we should ever skirt around or take that lightly. It is a difficult decision. Nobody in animal welfare ever takes that decision lightly. It is difficult for us. It is difficult to handle. Um, and then talk about why we would choose to euthanize an animal and that I feel like we are lucky to be able to alleviate suffering um, and prevent suffering. It's a tool that we have. Um, and when animals get to that point, it's the kindest thing that we can do at some point for them. Um, I don't have the time. Okay, well let's figure out a population that you do have time for. Neonatal kittens just require feeding every couple of hours. Do you have a boss that'll let you bring them to the office? Do you have a partner that'll rotate with you? Um, are you living in a group house and you got a bunch of people that'll take shifts? It's not a, it's not a lot of time when you look at it like that. Um, I don't have the space. Okay, let me talk about DC and space in DC. <laughs> it's expensive to live in DC. Most of our fosters are, I have a, a nice continuum of fosters in age range and um, socioeconomic status, but most people live in like one bedrooms or studios and they do this because neonatal kittens fit in a tiny little carrier. Um, and they don't require a lot of extra space. They don't start going to the bathroom on their own until they hit that three or four week mark, so they don't even really need a litter box until then. So it's very easy, they're very portable. Get a cute little bag, pop them in there. Most people won't even know you have babies. This is Sarah, she's the daughter of one of our longtime fosters, Rachel, and you can see she has a little nugget in her hands. Um, this, so, in my mind, bottle babies are in a couple phases. Like when they're first born, they're worms. They're little worms. And these are little nuggets. And then as they get better, they're like little ninja puff balls. Um, but so let's talk about recruitment. Um, high tech. Definitely use social media. You can actually target Facebook ads to zip codes, types of people who shop for cat shoes online, like there's all kinds of ways to target your ads. Um, and I'm guessing there's probably a donor out there who will help you cover the cost of those ads. And then you get the people who are really into it seeing your need. Um, and make sure that you're doing shareable posts, so not just inside a closed group, but like at large. Um, do posts, do hashtags to get the word out to more people. Um, so that everybody can see that you have this need for caring for this nugget population. Um, I also say go low tech, like print up some flyers. Um, give them to your kids that go to your camp and have them like put them in their schools, have them hang them in their, where they go to church or synagogue or whatever. Um, ask local government if you can put a flyer up in like their break room. Um, I love the idea of shop kittens. So um, there's a tattoo shop by me and I know that they love animals because I follow them on Instagram. Like if you are in Charles County, they would be a great place to tap because I know they would take great care of them um, and they could probably promote the heck out of them and pro promote the heck out of fostering. So, so think about that. Think about who can be your allies, who's already got a natural inclination, even if they're not necessarily animal welfare people. Um, and then a couple other brainstorms I have are doing pop-up trainings. So advertise you're gonna do a pop-up training um, and maybe you could do it at a farmer's market, Little League. Um, there's a small business day in the spring, at least in La Plata. Um, I know in La Plata they do like Friday concert series, so I'm sure other municipalities have something like that. So could you do a pop-up neonatal kitten training, bottle baby training before that? And then you um, that's how you onboard your fosters, right? That's how you get people in. Um, so you're kind of going a little bit outside your network. 
Um, so those are, those are some brainstorms. I'm sure you guys can think of way more creative ideas um, that work really well with where you live and the folks that um, you work with. You want to have an efficient process for getting your fosters through the front door. So you've got them all excited. You did all your advertising. You did your pop-up trainings, whatever you decide to do. Like, please don't make them wait three months because you have a person looking at the whatever process you have in place. We have a sign-up process that is completely staffed by volunteers. So, um, and it's a remote volunteering position, which is really great. People don't have to come into the shelter. They can do it on their couch. They can do it at work when they're bored, whatever. Um, and they go through and they screen our signups. I give them four big points that they have to look at. Are the people 18? Are there animals at home spayed and neutered? And I, for, I forget one other thing, but it's, there's a very, there's not a lot of barriers in place to get people on board. So the requirements I have of volunteers is that they are checking our signups. I have someone who does our dogs and someone who does our cats, that they are checking those every 24 to 48 hours. So if you submit a signup, you're getting a response from us within 24 to 48 hours. When I started, it was taking like two to three months because it was just a Jenna trying to get through all of that on top of all of the other things that I had to take care of, including the biggest thing is moving animals out of the shelter into homes. Um, so we set up a system where volunteers could do all of that. Um, there's some criteria in place for if there's some concerning remarks on the, app, on the application or sign up. And then we, have them do, we do have them check our shelter database just to make sure there are no flags that pop up in there. And if flags do pop up, the volunteer passes that off to a staff and the staff member handles that. But for 99% of signups, my staff don't touch that. They don't have to do anything with that. Just a quick check every couple days just to make sure we're being timely in our responses. And that's really it. Um, so the next step is an orientation process, if, you, if that's something you want to have. So we have an online orientation that our fosters complete. So um, they sign up, they get the invitation to go to online orientation. I just did a Google form with videos embedded. So it's me talking about stuff basically, so it's not super exciting. but. Um, but anyways, they have to answer a couple questions. They go to the next section. It doesn't take more than 20 minutes for them to get through it. And basically, I just focus on our processes at HRA for how you sign up to be a foster and how you get medical appointments and what happens in an emergency and what our adoption process looks like, all of that stuff. Um, right now, we also have them come to an animal care orientation, but we're actually going to get rid of that. We don't feel like it's super effective, um, and we think it puts an additional barrier in place that doesn't need to be there. Um, and what I would like to do is I'm going to realign my staff time with creating trainings that are actually meaningful to foster parents and also to build up the skill set that we need our fosters to have, right? Like, how do you handle a reactive dog, right? Like, that's probably more meaningful than us standing in front of you and saying, a dog needs food. You should put a leash on a dog. Like, doy, like people know that. Um, and if they don't, we have a whole system that manages that called case managers, which I will talk, I have a whole slide about that. Um, but make it efficient. Don't have barriers in place. Look, people that want to come foster for you want to come do something good, and you should assume that about them. Um, I can tell you we... In my last seven years, I've probably had three issues with level of care, and we don't have a high threshold for people getting in the front door to foster with us. So you should trust that if someone's willing to take the time to go online and go through orientation and come, come to your spiel about how to take care of animals, that these are people who truly want to help your organization and help your animals. Um, so make it simple. Make it as easy as possible for them to be part of your organization and help you guys out. Um, I say that with, it shouldn't be all about being super easy for them, but being really hard for you to manage all the ways you make it easy for them, right? Mm -hmm. So you want a streamlined process. So we did intentionally put a strategic barrier in place for fosters, and that was you must have internet access and you must have an email account to foster for us. We don't take applications over the phone. We don't do fax. We don't do like fill out an application and the coordinator will get back to you. Everything's online. You have to be able to independently manage that. And that's how we get all of our submissions. If you, if you can't 
meet that threshold, then our organization probably isn't going to work out well for you. We do all of our communication via email, all of that stuff. So you have to think about what's going to work well for you, for the people that you're working with. When I made that change, people got mad, and that's OK. Ch change is hard for people. But I needed, I needed something that was manageable and sustainable for the program. And again, when I made this change, it was, it was just me doing this. So I just didn't have time to like go find some paper application that somebody filled out, right? And then like, am I supposed to call you whenever we have like a change in how we do things, but everybody else can get email? Like, um, okay. So if someone wants to foster for us, they just got to go online, sign up, do animal, and do online orientation. It's simple. Um, right now, with the animal care orientations that we're doing, it doesn't take them more than three weeks to get through the whole process. Often in the summer, when we see people who are like, I totally want bottle babies, or someone's like, I really want a big pit bull, and I have a large backyard, we're like, why don't you come in tomorrow? Because we have lots of animals for you. Um, so so you, can, you can set things up. and. You can do one-on-one -on -one orientations at your discretion. I strongly advise doing them frequently. I, I, we really ask everybody to kind of go through our process so that our staff are able to use their time for figuring out what animals need to go to foster, supporting animals that are in foster, um, and being creative with how we grow our program. Okay. Bloop. <clears throat> Training fosters. So I'm going to go through this really quickly because Susan's going to talk about like every single detail of how you train and the things you need to go know. But um, having it frequent and easily accessible is really important. So starting in late March, we will be running bottle baby trainings essentially every two weeks through September. So as people become come on board, as people decide this is a population they want to take on, there is accessible training for them. Um, let's see. Training should include, so you want to make sure that fosters understand the life stages of neonatal kittens because that really tells them and guides them what kind of care to give the kittens. Um, what are your feeding standards? How frequently should they be fed? How much? And um, how they should be fed, right? Like we want to make sure people are feeding kittens with their tummies down. They're not holding them like human infants. Um, you know, some people will scruff and like try to, like you just want to make sure that people understand what your standards of care are. Um, the other thing you want fosters to understand is when should they be concerned. And so I've categorized things as um, flags, pink flags and red flags, right? So flags are, you know, if they haven't gained weight over the course of a day, it's something you definitely want to tune in and pay attention to because that is so predictive of their ability to thrive. But it may be resolved the next day, so it's not like a major emergency, but got to pay attention. Pink flags is like a continued lack of weight gain um, or weight loss over a few days. Like we're tipping into like the urgent area um, something to talk about, um, talk about your concerns with our case manager, see if we can problem solve, see if there are things that you can do with the care that you're providing to make an adjustment to their weight gain. Um, and then red flags are like that continued weight loss or not gaining weight. And then obviously vomiting and diarrhea, like that's a major red flag for our little nuglets and our worms. So we want to make sure that we are providing them with the supportive care that they need um, and making, getting them to a doctor or medical staff. Um, and then what are, what are your processes and expectations for the care of these guys? How and when should check-ins happen? How do they access your medical services? Who should their main point of contact be? What should they do in an emergency? And then I want to show you really quick what we have for them because um, we are a big organization and there's a lot to navigate. So um, we made them a quick reference sheet. And so I hope you guys can see this. Um, if they need to make, in a medical, make a medical appointment, so we tell them, guys, pop this up on your fridge. We give it to them every time they take an animal home. 
Um, so they know under what circumstances who to get in touch with for what, because like I said, we're, we're a big organization, so there's a lot for them to try to remember. And when you're in the middle of an urgent situation, like it, it's just hard to think through things, so it's nice to just have it written down for you. So this is the front of the, front of the sheet, and then the back of the sheet um, talks about how we define an emergency, how we will handle an emergency, and what they can expect. We will be sharing this with you guys as well. So you can make your own version. Um, um, the next two things that they should think of, you should think about when explaining your process is, when should they start preparing them for adoption? What's your threshold? Um, we tell our fosters right at the 1.6 pound mark to start taking pictures, make that spay neuter appointment. So they're like lining up at that two pound mark for spay neuter. And then as soon as they have all of the things they need, even before spay neuter, we make them available online. Our goal is that all of our kittens, all of our healthy kittens are getting adopted between two, I mean, between eight weeks and 10 weeks so that we are having a nice flow of kittens through the foster system. Um, <clears throat> and then how does adoptions from foster work? Do they return them all to the shelter? Are, are they doing the adoption counseling? Do they just show the animals off and your staff does the adoption counseling? Let them know how that's going to work. Do you have adoption events that you want them to bring kittens to? So, um, so yeah. All right. So one of the things, <laughs> I know, it's so cute with that boop. Um, what, what I have found to be the most effective way to bring people outside of your organization in to help understand as much as possible is to be very transparent with them. And so I'll talk about our expectations of foster parents, but the next slide's going to talk about what they should be able to expect from the organization. So. What is it that you expect of them in terms of availability? Um, so in a at HRA, we use a proactive foster system. Um, we call it on deck. And essentially, we ask all of our foster parents who are available to foster to sign up on deck. We use a Google form for it. Um, and they tell us all about themselves. And they select a date of availability. And so we hold them to that. And it is up to them to change that if they are no longer available. And they can say, I only want neonatal kittens and don't give me one with a URI. They can tell us all about the things that they want to take care of and don't want to take care of. They can opt into our special programs that they have. And then we use all of that criteria to match them with an appropriate match. Um, they don't get to pick their animals. They get to take a sight unseen animal for the most part with us. Um, but it really helps us. There's no call out, we need bottle baby fosters. Bottle babies come in, I have them stacked up, I get to see who, what, what capacity we have. You know what, I don't have anybody to take worms right now, you need to call Arlington and we need to send them over to Marnie. Like it helps you gauge your capacity for care and what you're able to support. It also helps you gauge when you do need to do a call out. Guys, I have 14 senior cats that need placement. This is Harvey, he's an example of that senior cat. If you have a capacity to take a senior cat, please get on deck and let us know. We have trained our fosters to know that by doing this, they are helping us save the animals that need to go into foster. And so when I made this change, there were definitely some people who were really upset they couldn't pick out their black and white two week old kittens. And I was like, I don't even have that. Like, can you just take the kittens I have? Um, so what, it, what, are your, what is it your expectations of them, right? And so does it work perfectly? Sometimes we reach out to someone who said they're available and they're like, actually, I'm going out this weekend. And then we like give them a slap on the wrist and say, we just want to remind you that this was a commitment you made when you said you wanted to foster for us. And um, if it happens again, we'll have to look at your ability to participate, participate in our program. If they're like, oh my God, I just had to go out. I just got called out of work out of town for work, like we will certainly understand that. Or if there's a family emergency, there's obviously flexibility in how we assess the situation. Um, but how we got buy into this, because this was a real transition for our foster parents when we asked them to like tell us what they could take 
and then be available on or after the date they said they could take the animal. People had a hard time with this. And so I essentially made up a, a flow chart of the timelines for when certain populations come in and how long it takes to get them out based on a traditional placement system and a proactive placement system. And we are able to get our neonates into kitten, into fosters within less than 24 hours. Our kittens that come in that are under six weeks of old, under six weeks old, it only takes us a day or two to get them out into foster because people are ready and willing to take them. Our coordinators simply send an email and say, we have a litter of three kittens ready for you to pick up at New York Avenue. You can pick up between these, these hours. And they come with their little carrier and we pop them in and see you later. Um, so it works really well with being proficient and efficient with moving most of your animals out. It also is a great communication tool for the rest of this like animal care um, and behavior. Those are the other two teams that we work really closely with. Letting them know, I am so sorry we don't have capacity to support that dog right now. Or, hey, I'm going to be clearing out four cages by the end of the day for you. Um, that's really helpful when animal care is trying to make decisions about where to put animals and how many cages they need. Like some of you might have contracts about how many cages you need to have open at night. Like that's a, that's a big tool to use to be able to predict that stuff. Um, so pick up. Animals that fall within critical care, so our neonates, anything with an infectious disease, when we email you, we expect you to come as soon as you're able. So like if you're at work, like come after work and come pick up those kittens. We will give you a carrier, we will give you what you need, but you need to come ASAP. Um, don't tell me tomorrow morning, don't like, no, you need to come. With other populations that are able to like feed themselves and can sustain a stay a little bit longer, um, aren't gonna infect the rest of our population, we say 24 hours within the time that we send you an email for pickup. Um, <clears throat> care standards. What types of su supplies as fosters do they need to provide? We ask our foster parents to provide um, all of the necess all the normal care supplies that you would provide for any animal. So dogs and cats, all the standard stuff, litter, food, dishes, leash, all that good stuff. Um, if animals require specialty care, we will provide you with starter supplies or we will provide sustained supplies. So like prescription food, medication, that kind of stuff, we will always provide that. Um, with our, for our neonatal kittens, we provide formula, we provide a nipple, we provide bottles, we provide a scale, and we provide snuggle safes. We wanna get our snuggle safes and scales back so that we can reuse them. Um, and as people become like, if that's their jam as neonatal kittens, they usually get their own supplies. Um, we're very clear about our capacity and ability to provide supplies for fosters. We don't have great storage at either one of our facilities. But if someone were to come to me and say, I really want to foster a litter of kittens, but that's a lot of food that I would have to provide for the next couple of weeks, I will give them cases of food as they need them from the shelter supply. I just don't advertise it widely because it's not sustainable, it's not sustainable for our budget to be able to give every foster that much food, right? But lots of fosters do um, wish lists on Amazon, and so all their friends just send chewy boxes to them filled with great supplies. Um, so let's see. What type of formula should they be using? Like, can they use goat's milk? Should they use goat's milk? Do you just want them to use formula? Do you want them to use a formula with a probiotic in it? Like, these are the things that you should be communicating to people so that there are no misunderstandings. Um, what type of equipment should they be using? Are you okay with them syringe feeding your bottle babies? Or do you only want them to use a bottle? Um, should they be forcing any formula into your kittens or should they only let kittens eat on their own? Like those are things you want to help them understand and also talk about the why. Like forcing causes aspiration, which is almost death for baby, tiny baby worms like these guys. So um, do, you, do you want them to use a heating pad? Do you only want them to use a snuggle safe? Is it okay if they purchase an incubator? Like... I have really sophisticated people who buy like incubators for their babies. So um, what happens when they don't reach de developmental milestones? What does that mean? How are we going to deal with it? 
Um, how frequently do they need to come in for checkups? Um, what, are, what are your vaccine protocols? Where will they need to come for those services? Are they only available in the middle of the day during the week? Like those are things you should let people know. How long will it take for a sick appointment? How long will it take to get a sick appointment? Just stuff that people need to know so they can like, either plan appropriately or realize that maybe this isn't a good fit for them. Communication. How should they communicate? What are the appropriate modes of communication within your department? Can they call you anytime? Do you want them to communicate by email? Um, let's see. OK. Um, at HRA, we ask that our fosters communicate 99% of their needs via email. Um, it allows us to have really great documentation, but also, like, I don't know about you guys, but like checking the voicemail, taking the notes, figuring out, playing phone tag, that's like a, that's like a big waste of time, to be honest. Um, so can they, can they eat, reach out via Facebook? Is that okay? Or do you want everything to just come through whatever email you've established? Um, and then just explain why you're asking them to do that. And sometimes it's just because it's the most convenient way for your staff to operate. And we want to make sure we're catching everybody's communication. Um, <clears throat> so at HRA, we've, we've, when I talk about my case managers, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But all of our case managers work out of communal email boxes, and they have standard email addresses. So kittens at Humane Rescue Alliance, dog foster, cat foster, and small animals. And then our staff even have an email alias. So when someone emails that, it goes to all of my foster staff. And so. Um, our case managers primarily use that, and we use that internally for staff. But it's one thing for fosters to remember, rather than who's the foster coordinator now, and how do I send them an email, and you know, it just makes it a little bit more convenient. But it also helps with your coordination of things. So who should they be communicating with? What? So, that qu so a quick reference sheet is really great to guide them, um, and then. Um, we, our first line of communication for our fosters is their case managers, which we'll talk about real soon. Um, and then the next is foster staff. Um, and then we have plans for specific emergencies that we don't want to go into an email. We want them calling our front desk so they get immediate support and assistance in emergency situations. And then how quickly should they be responding to communication from you? So if we send you an email, is it OK to wait a week before you respond? Or do we want a response within like 48 hours from you? I mean, I think it's important to establish that because then you, it can ping when there's an issue, right? Um, if everybody's operating on the same set of rules, then we know when there's, when there's a flag. Um, and then what should they expect if they don't hear back from you? Like what? How, how are you going to handle that? So case managers ping that for, from us. We usually make sure that case managers have done an initial check-in to make sure everything's OK and that we really need to hear back from you. If that doesn't happen, staff then send a nice email. If, staff, if they don't, we don't hear back after that, then staff takes the bad cop approach and says, if we don't hear from you within the next 24 hours, we will send an officer to your home to do a welfare check. We don't say what kind of officer it is. Um, but <laughs> people don't want people with uniforms just showing up at their house, <laughs> um, knocking on their door and say, are the kittens OK? Um, so um, usually we get a real fast response after that. Um, and so just figure out what that's going to be for your organization so you can help people understand, like, it's important and we need to know that our animals are okay and that you're okay. Um, let's see. Emergencies. Defining what constitutes emergencies really helps. You were, you're always going to get somebody that's panicking or nervous about something and feel it feels like an emergency to them and it's just helpful for them to hear. I know that's really scary, but let me tell you that this is a totally normal thing. And if you're really worried, I want you to go ahead and schedule an appointment to be seen tomorrow. We'll check it out. Sometimes that's all people need to like just decompress a little bit. I know I one time came home and I found a kitten that was like not reactive, 
just like like limp and like I picked it up and it peed everywhere and I was like <laughs> and I call I was like panicking I called our veterinarian and she's like Jenna just rub caro syrup on their gums and I was like okay doy sorry I knew that um, but when you're freaked out you're freaked out and it's hard to like think through things um, all right how do they get in touch with you to communicate the emergency can they just run it into the shelter? Do they need authorization? Do they go to an emergency provider? Do you have a veterinarian that will see them? All those things help them navigate and stay calm. And yes, people do the wrong thing sometimes, but that's, that's okay, we figure it out. Most people do the right thing most of the time. So um, what happens when a kitten, kitten passes away? Um, what should they do if this, this happens? Um, who should they notify and how long do they have? I think if you put that out there that we know animals die sometimes in foster care. Um, here's, what we, we ha here's how we deal with that. It helps people process that and not feel like a lot of shame and even having to reach out and say that the animal died in their care. Um, and then like letting your staff know how to handle that situation should a deceased animal arrive. Procedurally, yes, like what needs to happen? How do we document it? How do we, do we do an acropsy? When do we do an, like all of that stuff should be established. But the other really key important point, a piece of this is how do we interact with the person that's coming in to bring us a deceased foster animal, right? We want to talk, give them words that help them interact appropriately. We want to help them understand to take a minute to recognize that this is a really difficult thing for this person. Just because it's something like our front desk probably handles a couple DOAs a day, like that's normal for them. Um, there should be some compassion in that interaction to help people along and help people not, inevitably they're gonna blame themselves really critically and we want people to feel supported and like they can try again. Um, all right. What happens when they can no longer provide care? Life happens, you know, things come up. What's their process for that? Do they find their own foster replacement? Do they come back to the shelter? Do you help them find a placement? Like, how's it gonna work for you guys? Um, what happens if an animal goes missing? Y'all. <sighs> Mostly it's feral moms that get up in some ceiling somewhere, but... Um, it shouldn't happen that, I, I, I've never had it happen with a neonatal kitten, but like little mobile kittens, we talked to our foster parents about like getting low and like looking and finding the spaces that you didn't know existed. I one time found like, you know how your kitchen cabinets go down and there's like that space between the cabinets and the floor. I realized there's a hole in the corner. There's a, y'all. <laughs> so, the, the thing behind the toilet, sometimes that's not like against like affixed to the wall and like they get it like, so talking about that so they can kitten proof their house and be as proactive about it as possible. Um, but helping talk through like where they could possibly be like they get up in like beds and couches like in the box springs and stuff. I always I, lo I love kitten breakaway collars with bells on them because just like moving around your house with kittens, you gotta like shuffle the feet or else someone's getting punted. Like <laughs> it's, at least the bells help you have like an early warning system, but also if they're like jingling around in some corner under your cabinets, you can hear them um, and not think that like you totally lost the kittens. Um, but talk, talk to people about that, because then people like tell you they lost an animal and they again feel horrible, and you're like, yeah, it happens. Um, so bites, you want to define what a bite means. Um, our level is if it breaks skin and there's blood. And so we want to know if there's an animal to human bite or if there's animal to animal bites. If people are biting animals, that is a much more serious problem. Um, and then talk about what happens, what, what, are, what your process is when a bite happens, right? So the animal will have to go on a bite quarantine. And if it has this level of vaccine, the quarantine will be this long. And if it's two animals, like, you know, there's all the like multiple combinations and whatever it is for your jurisdiction. But bite quarantine sounds so scary to people who don't understand what it means. It just means keeping the animal 
in a known location, monitoring them for signs of illness, and making sure they have minimal interactions with other animals and other people. So if something crops up, it's not spreading around. So that's what you need to let people know. I literally got bitten by a kitten this year and I had to file a bite report. Y'all, I had to file a bite report with my own organization because my kitten bit me. It was embarrassing, but Green Bean was on a 10-day bite quarantine. So, um, but it, you know, it happens. Kittens get chewy and they don't understand like when to stop and then you have a bite, so. But if you're placing like feral, fractious moms, like you really wanna talk about how you set them up for success, how we house them appropriately, how we have double barrier systems, how we clean cages, how they don't get stuck in your loft or like attack your dog because your dog walked into the room. I've had all this stuff happen. Mm -hmm. So um, who makes the decisions about the animal? So this is an important expectation to establish with foster parents. Fostering is kind of a weird thing because you are providing all of the care for this animal, but with most organizations, you are not the decision maker for this animal. Um, and so talking about what that means that your organization, if this is how you want to set it up, your organization is the decision maker. And so if there's a medical situation, if there's a behavior situation, if we want to make a decision about adoption placement, we are the ones that make that decision and we need to ask that you are okay with that. Um, and we actually have them sign that in the release that we have, our foster parents. Um, some, when some people get upset, they get upset about things and that's okay. Um, we have conversations about it, but ultimately establishing that baseline of who the decision maker is. Maybe they're a partner with you guys in decision making. I, I don't know, but whatever it is, define it for people. All right, training fosters, what they can expect from you. Communication. How often they sh should they expect check-ins from you? Are you gonna check in with them? Um, who should they expect the check-ins will be from? Will it be the same person? Will it be multiple people? Um, and how frequently can they contact you? And what can they expect in terms of your response time to them? So we have Timelines that we set for our, our case managers, um, and those are based on the experience level of the foster parent and the fragility of the animal being placed in foster. So specifically talking about neonatal kittens, every group of neonatal kittens that are placed in foster get a check-in the first 24 hours the animals are placed in foster care, and then every 72 hours until they hit that four-week mark, and then we go to a one-week check-in after that. So that's what we ask of our volunteers and staff. Fosters, anytime they need something, they can reach out to their case manager, ask questions, not feeling sure about something, just need someone to like level them out a little bit. Whatever it is, they can reach out on their own terms for whatever they need. Um, let's see, resources. It is important to have resources in place. Maybe you can't come up with an entire manual this year. We will give you one that you can use, but maybe you won't like it, I don't know. Um, but have info sheet fact sheets that you can hand to them as they pick up the animal or you can email them when you're making the match so they have that as a reference point. Um, and then talk about other resources, like how accessible are your medical resources gonna be? What are you able to invest into the medical emergencies of bottle baby kittens? What resources do you have and where your cutoff lines are gonna be? Um, I think with regard to resources, we have a website that we're developing for our foster parents that will essentially serve as a foster manual, but we can update it in real time, which is really nice, so there aren't paper copies that you're constantly trying to stay on top of. Um, and then let's see, supplies. What are you able to provide? So let them know, and we're gonna give you these if you come take this population. Um, emergencies, again, those clear expectations of what to happen when things kind of go haywire or unexpectedly. I have found that it alleviates a lot of stress, but it also alleviates a lot of arguments with people who understand where our cutoff is and where we're gonna have to make a euthanasia decision. Supporting fosters. One of the, my favorite things about my foster parents is they, they have built this amazing community. 
And we just set, set up the bones of that and then they did the rest themselves. Um, so set up ways for your foster parents to be able to communicate with each other. We created a Google group for cat fosters and dog fosters. And what I love is that not only can we send them the information we need to give them through that method, but they can talk amongst themselves. They can ask for support when they need it. Um, we set guidelines, so we ask that they stick to foster topics, animal care topics. Um, that they, so they, for the most part, unless they're fostering a really special animal that we wanna have some discretion over what home it goes to, if they need a foster sitter, they reach out and they get sitters. There are people who can't commit four weeks to taking on kittens, but they are like, they are like waiting for someone to say, can someone watch my kittens this weekend? <laughs> like, it is very rare that an animal ever, once they go into foster, has to come back to sh the shelter because we have people who, when they reached out, they said, I can't take a dog for two, four weeks. And we said, could you take them for a weekend? And they said, yeah. I said, come to orientation, just be on the lookout for when they need foster sitters. Could you transport? Can you drive animals to appointments? Could you pick up animals and drop them off at the foster's home? Yeah, I can do that. Cool. So fosters do this all themselves. It is not staff. So for example, if someone gets matched with neonatal kittens and they're like, hey, I've got a late meeting tonight. Can someone pick these guys up for me and drop them off at my house? I live in Petworth. Someone inevitably is like, yep, gotcha. I don't have to do nothing. My staff doesn't have to do anything. They figure it out themselves. I got to get them to an emergency appointment. Can someone take my kittens? Can someone take my dog? All of this stuff, fosters are doing for each other. Um, I was just told I have pan loot kittens and I don't know how to give, they showed me how to give fluids at the shelter, but I'm really scared to do it. Someone will say, I know how to give fluids, I'll come over and help you out. All of that stuff they do for each other and it's really great and they provide a level of support that then our staff doesn't have to step in and do. They also, um, we also have Facebook groups. So to be a foster for us, you have to be on the listserv, but we also do Facebook groups and you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to be on Facebook, but we love it because it's a great, you can do, this, that's where I got like all these pictures from. So, <clears throat> so use that. It's a great way to advertise things that you need. It's a great way for people to be engaged. Um, a lot of people tend to be really hesitant about doing groups or social media because sometimes fosters say some not great stuff. Um, but that's okay. I have found, as our foster parents have become more sophisticated, man, they call people out on stuff. <laughs> and they get it right, and I don't have to be the mean person about it. So it's really great, and they give them the information that they need. Um, and again, it, ta it takes a weight off of staff having to be the constant response system for foster parents. Um, sometimes they talk about really difficult things. That's okay too. People need support during difficult times and it's okay to let people know that sometimes it can be really hard to be a foster parent, um, but you're not alone and there are other people that have gone through the same thing. Um, create ways for foster parents to support one another. So. Like I said, social media email is great, um, but give them roles that they can fulfill if they cannot commit to a traditional foster placement. Um, and like I said, they serve as foster sitters, transporters, cheerleaders, um, grief counselors, info providers. They, do, they can do tag team feedings um, and do advanced support trainings. All right, create resources. So kind of talked about this, so I'm just gonna kind of like zip through it. Um, and we'll also be providing you a lot of these resources for you to use. So handouts, guides, I, lo I love a good checklist. We have checklists for everything. I even have checklists for like the coordinators when they're like preparing an animal to go into foster, so they hit all the things. Um, I have checklists for the people that send the animal out to make, all the th make sure all the things that need to go with the animal go out. Um, and then obviously training. Training is really important for people to feel confident, especially in taking on those um, more um, technically challenging populations. All right, moustache. Okay, case managers. 
I love case managers. These are our volunteers that have been specially trained to support our foster parents. So um, they are the ones providing that one-on-one -on -one support. I forget how I make an appointment. Oh my gosh, this kitten's poop looks weird. Can you look at it? Like that's what the case managers are doing. Um, and our case managers are grouped by age and species. So I have an adult dog case manager. I have unweaned kitten case managers. Um, our unweaned take care of both bottle babies and moms and babies. I have two case managers that do that. Um, I cap cases at um, our newest persons at 10 cases, our most experienced person, Amanda, who is one of our very first case managers, um, has been doing this for six years now. Um, sh she wants more, so I give her up to 15. So we have the capacity to place 25 litters of unweaned kittens because we have case managers that can support them. And so it feels really good when you're placing fragile populations. It can feel really scary to send them out with someone who's like a brand new bottle feeder. You're like, oh God, I hope they make it. But with case managers, they have someone there guiding them through hooking them up with more experienced fosters that can help them if they're having trouble feeding, if they won't take the bottle, if they can't get the kitten to gain weight. All of those things are being troubleshooted and responded to it, pretty much in real time. Our case managers are great and, they're, and the, our foster parents get the support they need. Um, we typically recruit them from our foster pool of people who are like our rock stars or have shown really great skill or expertise that are also really great communicators and have lots of compassion and empathy for people. Um, and then they're trained by myself or my program manager to do this. It only takes about two trainings. We give them access to our shelter database. Um, and we build, the, build their cases up. So they don't start with 10, they start with like one and they get a a, um, a seasoned case manager that is their mentor. So it's not even staff answering all of their questions. It's another case manager answering all of their questions. And then when something's kind of above people's pay grade, then they go to staff. Um, so they are the gatekeepers. They are the ones providing the hand holding to all of our foster parents, but they're also holding them accountable for getting them ready for adoption and making all of their vaccine appointments and all of that stuff. Case managers are helping us ensure foster parents are moving kittens through the foster system and nobody's just like kind of camping out in foster land. Um, let's see, I talked about using the communal inbox. So everybody that manages kittens works out of our kitten inbox. I let them establish how they manage that, color code it, sort it. We have um, guidelines for subject lines so people know which case manager needs to answer the email. But the thing that I really like about the communal inbox is that if someone is in an emergency situation and they can only think to email kittens, because there's so many people checking that email, they can immediately forward that to staff or immediately say, you need to call this phone number and let HRA know what's going on. Um, <clears throat> case managers don't handle emergency situations. They, they are expected to respond to email communication within 24 hours. So they are responding to non-urgent issues. Like I said, every once in a while, someone forgets and emails them first. But it is not their job to triage an emergency with animals. It's only their job to, if it comes in and they catch it, to say, here's, let me remind you of the process for getting help. Um, so how, how do we do this? I use a Google Sheet. Um, I love Google. Um, and basically, when an animal goes into foster, our coordinator adds that group to the case management sheet and assigns a case manager. Case managers are just expected to check that sheet on a daily basis so they know who their new, new cases are. We set what the communication timeline should be and we let them know a little bit about what's going on with the critters that are going into foster. Um, case managers then use our database to like do a thorough review of the person and whoever and what's going on with the animals. They reach out, they introduce themselves, they say, hey, looks like Fluffy or is due for vaccines in two weeks. It's the middle of summer, it gets really busy at the medical center, go ahead and schedule that appointment now. Here's the link to schedule that appointment. So they're giving them next steps, but they're also giving them more information. 
These are the people that talk about the stray cat's resume when they came in and the circumstances under which the cat came in and why Fluffy was out on the streets and whatever it is that the foster wants to know. We will give, the case manager gives them all of that backstory so staff isn't having to do that part of it. So I, they, I, we, couldn't, we couldn't do it without them. I just, I can't emphasize that much, as, uh, enough. I have about 10 to 15 volunteer case managers that help us with all the various populations of animals, even small animals. Um, I have a guy that specializes in that and he knows everything about geckos and birds and uh, guinea pigs and things. So he helps with those guys. The more difficult cases, so critical medical cases, um, our humane hold cases, those are all managed by staff. We don't have volunteers managing those. But 95% of animals that are in foster, their cases are managed by volunteers. Um, the other thing that I really love about them is they're able to provide really great customer service to our foster parents. There's nothing worse than feeling like you don't know what to do with an animal that you think is not thriving and not being able to get support. That's that's probably one of the worst feelings I think of fostering. Um, and so having someone there that can say, you're right, that's super scary. Let me tell you how to deal with it. Or, oh my gosh, that totally happened to me the first time I fostered too and I thought, I, I thought something real, was really wrong. Um, it's how you train and retain foster parents. A lot of the learning with animal care, you can read an SOP, you can read a manual, someone can tell you how to do it, but the real learning is in doing it and dealing with different scenarios and then feeling really confident and competent in dealing with those scenarios. Um, so um, the other thing is staff then are only dealing with the most tricky situations. They're not answering all the poop questions. They are only answering stuff that kind of elevates to the level of a staff member. <clears throat> so staff then have bandwidth to place more animals in foster, to develop more resources for foster parents. I, I don't think most people who, most people I think who are running foster programs are also probably doing volunteers or doing transfers or other things. They're wearing lots of different hats and it gets really hard when you get in the weeds to be able to like actually plan things and come up with a process and procedure for things when you're when your cages are just overflowing with animals. Um, case managers gave me the bandwidth to do that stuff. There's just no way I would have been able to figure everything out without having to share the load with people. Um, I just want to emphasize this. When I first started, like my inbox had like 87 poop questions and like pictures of poop and like, <laughs> so case managers, way less poop questions. So that's great. Um, and I think the biggest deal is that they really prevent staff from burning out. The way I was able to sustain staying in a foster manager position for five years was that I had people to share the load. It wasn't just all on me. It can feel insurmountable when it's just on one person. So, all right. So let's talk about supporting fosters medical. So I think it's really important to start somewhere, even if you just come up with a diarrhea protocol this year, um, figuring that out. So what medical care needs, um, what will be the responsibility of the organization? And I, I hope this is a theme that you guys are getting. It cannot just be on the foster department. The organization has to take ownership and has to figure out resources. It took me forever to get medical to understand that foster animals are part of the shelter and just because they are out of sight does not mean that they are out of mind. They are our animals. Think of it as the third shelter location because it took, because they were like, well, we have to do these foster appointments. It's taking up our time. Yes, they are animals. We need to provide care for them. That is what we do as a shelter. Um, so getting them to buy in, getting them to be a part of the process. Um, what, what's going to happen for the most common issues with neonatal kittens? Anorexia, lack of weight gain, weight loss. 
How are you guys going to handle that? Um, how are you guys going to handle diarrhea? How are you guys going to, what is that? 20 minutes. Thank you. Cool. I, cool. Okay. Um, how are you guys going to handle URI? Um, what about identifying potentially infectious diseases like panluc, ringworm? Are you going to have a protocol for in shelter? And then are you going to have a protocol for foster? Um, I will say that when I first started doing foster land, we absolutely euthanized panluc. As soon as it was positive, we did not deal with it. It needed to go. We didn't want it in our shelter. That was really scary. Now we place them in foster. They come, posi come, come up positive in foster. They stay in foster. Um, one of my kittens that I had a couple years ago, this was probably one of the first cases we put in foster, he, he came up panluc positive. And I was like, not today, Satan. I'm taking this kitten home. And I set up a little quarantine ward in my house. I just put like shower curtain liners, like all my house is carpeted, so I just put shower curtain liners everywhere. I set up a dog crate. They had their own dedicated supplies. I did like special clothes for while I was in there and everything. And well, they survived. We did it. We saved them. And it was great. Um, so sometimes it just takes one person saying, I'll try it and let's see how it goes. And then we develop protocols around treating and what happens when they're positive, what medications we give, what criteria do we use to euthanize, what criteria do we say, yes, we want to try and continue to work with um, these guys. Um, but got to think through all of those things, right? Um, we do car appointments when it's a suspected um, infectious disease in foster. So we ask the foster that they stay in their car and the tech and the DVM or whoever is the right staff go out all gowned up and stuff and they look at the animal and then do the necessary diagnostics and figure out next steps. Um, so that way they're not actually coming into the shelter environment, bringing all those cooties with them. Um, who sees the kittens when they're sick? Is it a tech? Is it foster staff? Is it general medical? Is it general staff? Do you have a veterinarian that you work with? In what capacity? What is their availability to see this population? What is their experience even with this population? A lot of vets have maybe only seen a neonatal kitten when they were doing their vet school stuff. Um, I mean, maybe they want to learn and they're really into it. That's cool. Um, let's see. Will you have an external service provider? And if so, are you going to do standing orders with them? Do they have to call you every time? Does a foster have to get approval to go see them? Under what circumstances? Um, I want to talk a little bit about our medical on-call system that we have um, because our vets were getting burnt out because they were the only ones that were, and I know I say vets and everybody's like, oh my god, vets. Um, but they were getting burnt out. And so all of senior staff, so anybody at the operations level or VP level who was anywhere related to anything operations, became medical on call. So at night between 5 and 8, we all, take a, we all rotate through a schedule and we get called. So front desk calls us. Um, if it's an officer that needs a decision made, if it's a member of the public, if it's a foster, um, Front desk calls us, tells us what's going on. I usually say, can you have the foster or the officer call me? And I talk to them. We figure out what next steps are going to be. Um, and I only have to do that a couple times a month, whereas our vets were doing it a couple times a week, right? So sharing the load, making sure that those people who can be decision makers are part of the process. Um, let's see. Who provides routine care? And then who provides access to sick care? Um, and then how are they going to access these resources? So I want to show you kind of what we have set up. Um, let's see. So it really helped us to block out predictable appointment times with our medical staff. And then we align certain appointments with staff. So it's not a vet that needs to see every appointment. Like techs can give vaccines. Techs can do 90% of what needs to be done with kittens. Um, and so every month, I just send our tech managers this schedule. <clears throat> and you can see we have things divided into appointment types. 
and then blocked out times when those appointments are going to happen. And we have two locations, so we do it for both locations. And then what I do is I then put these into our foster appointment system. So fosters, all they have to do is go online to make an appointment. So we use Acuity, which is an online appointment schedule. It only costs us about $20 a month. Um, and vet techs and foster staff don't have to go back and forth and say, when can you come in? Can you come in? Oh, that's booked now. Can you come in on this date? Um, it's really been so helpful in streamlining our processes. So this is what it looks like. We have a vanity URL that only fosters have access to. This is not accessible via our main website, so we don't have members of the public <laughs> scheduling foster appointments. Um, and so, let's see. With our kitten, kitten and puppies, we did one appointment that covers all the things because we found inevitably people came in for vaccines and they're like, well, he's been kind of having a runny nose. And then our techs were like, ugh. Um, so we just said, if you have medical concerns or you need boosters and deworming, this is the appointment you make for any critter under three months old. Um, and then we also have urgent appointments for, to address things that need to, like pretty much happen. They happen in the morning. We have them pretty much every day of the week. And staff are, I mean, and fosters are really good about only using them for urgent needs. But this is what it looks like. They just click on the appointment type. They check whatever location they want. And then they just click on the time that they, day and time that they want. And then they have to fill out a form and then medical staff can kind of see what's going on with them. And they make the appointment and I love this feature. It texts and emails them reminders. <laughs> and if they need to change it, there's a link in the email that they just reschedule or cancel the appointment. You don't have to do any of that stuff, which is really great. And then the last slide I have is I just really want to talk about the people component of fostering. So this is Juliet. She's actually a case manager for us. And she loves, obviously, our little nuggets. Um, and a couple things I just kind of want to talk through with people. It can be really hard to have compassion for people when you've given them the information, you've told them the information, you give them a case manager and they still don't get it. So it's, it can be very frustrating when you're like, yo, I gotta get all these animals out, I ain't got time for all your drama, right? But <laughs> let's give them some space to be human beings and let's lean into that a little bit, right? So panic is normal, panic is part of fostering. We want people that are going to panic and be worried about the care of their animals. Um, that makes a great foster parent. We just need to ha help them gauge when they should panic or not, right? Um, I have to say, one of my most favorite emails I ever got from a foster parent was, Jenna, thank you for helping me when I lost my shh. <laughs> because she called, she was freaking out. She's like, I know I'm not supposed to call, but here's what's happening, and oh my god. And I was like, OK, so let's talk through it. I hung up the phone, and then she was like, 10 minutes later, she's like, sent me that email. And just remembering in the moment, because it not, it, it was, I was like, girl, what are you even worried about? But, you know, giving people space to have the feelings they have and trying to be a little less judgmental about it, because it can be really frustrating sometimes. Um, and the other perspective I'd like to offer is like, when people, we forget because we learn so much about caring for animals, we know so much of the things that you need to know, that it gets really hard to remember that first time you took care of an animal or like your dog when you were a kid, like how you handled that. And you're like, now you're like, oh my God, I would never do that. But when people are not trained animal welfare people and they're caring for animals that are fragile to them, or maybe they've never even cared for that population before, there's gonna be panic. Um, and that's normal. And just, ex just reassure them that you appreciate their level of care and that you understand. Um, and then I will say hello case managers and hello fellow fosters for support because you can always refer them to their volunteers and folks who can provide them that additional comfort and levels of support. So grief is normal. We want, again, these are all good, em good emotions that we want people to have for our animals. Um, 
And so it's a tough emotion to deal with because we all often feel sadness for the loss of the animal. We feel compassion for the person. And so sometimes it's hard not to just like bust out crying too. But you know what? Sharing tears with people is okay. It shows them that you care too, that um, they're not crazy for feeling this way. Um, let them be heartbroken. Let them be angry. Um, let them take a step back from fostering if they need to. Let them know that all of that is normal and you understand. Um, let them express how they want to on your listserv and on Facebook. You will often find that fosters provide, other fosters provide great calming, great um, strategies for processing and dealing with the feelings. Um, let's see. Saying goodbye is hard. So the goal in fostering always is goodbye. We always want our foster parents to have that goal in mind. And I say that, I foster failed like seven times. So, um, but I have the capacity to continue fostering. It's not preventing me from being a foster. But, um, So how do we help fosters get there? I mean, we are asking them to hand feed animals until they are big enough to go to a home. That's a pretty intimate relationship that they're establishing with a critter. So we give them some strategies. I always recommend getting more kittens and filling that hole in your heart with more kittens. Um, I always say when I first started fostering, I started with dogs. And it helped me tremendously to see how excited the family was to welcome this new family member into their home. And as even though I was like ugly, like snot crying when I had to hand the dog over, like it, it made me feel so good to see like they bought the collar and they got the food and they got the bed and they were just like so excited to have this furry creature in their home. So that might be a great coping mechanism. Now, I get really burned out from having to deal with adopters, so I place all of my kittens on the adoption floor. So um, I get to peek down, I get to say hey to the adopter, you're getting a really great cat, we're really excited for you. Um, here's my card if you ever need anything or follow me on social media so I can see, I can stalk you that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then be their cheerleaders. Fosters and volunteers are your partners and your allies. And I think it's hard sometimes to get other staff members to get to that point. Volunteers will put it in your face when things aren't going right, and that's okay. Then you have a conversation, then you adjust. Um, but you cannot get to 90% or above live release rate without having volunteer partners and allies in your corner. Um, so make them feel it. Make them, let them know how proud you are of them, of how much they help your organization, of that they contributed this percent to your 90%. Let them know what it is that they're doing for you. Give them confidence when they need it. I can't tell you how often we've reached out to people who we know have the skills but don't necessarily have the confidence to take on special populations and we let them know how confident we feel in them, and we let them know we'll be there for them. Um, try and have personal interactions with them. As much as possible, try and send out a couple animals yourself. Try to have engagement activities for them. Our fosters actually put on a potluck every year, which is really great, and we all go to that. Um, and just when something unexpected comes up, like a pan Luke diagnosis, Letting them know they can do it, that you trust them, and that they, that, look, if they don't try, that's the only lifeline that that animal has. So if they don't try, they're gonna die. Um, but just be their cheerleaders, give them the confidence that they need so that you can develop a really successful pool of people that are gonna help you with your vo most vulnerable population.